Hey everyone, how's it going? Hey everybody, thanks for joining. Hi everyone, happy snow day. I hope everyone's been able to kind of take today, at least if you're in the Northeast, at least if you're in um, New York, we've had a ton of um, snow come down over the last couple days. Hey everybody, how's it going? Oh my gosh, all these little waves. Hi Adikar, hi Dr. Heather, hi everyone. Hey everybody. Someone said, how's Deco in the snow? He's loving, Dan Price asked, how's Deco in the snow? He's loving it. Um, we got Deco last January actually. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he got a little bit of snow, um, experience when he was a little puppy, but he has way more now. Um, so he's loving it. Hi everybody. Hey everyone. Thanks for joining. All right. Let's hop to it. Um, so I'm hopping on live today, um, to talk about what happened at the Capitol and, um, I want to just say a couple of things in advance. One is that, um, first of all, I am sorry if this live is like very wide reaching. It's not my intent to ramble. Um, but a lot went on and a lot led up to when, to what went on. Um, and I think it's important to, talk about it. Um, so, you know, that's first things first is that thanks for your patience as I try to communicate this story to you in advance. Um, secondly, you know, I think it's important for me to say that my story is one of many stories of what happened in the Capitol. Um, there were food service workers there were that were afraid for their lives. There were custodial workers that had to clean up after the just wreckage of white supremacists and many of those workers were black and brown and immigrant um, then put in through the experience of having to clean up clean up for white supremacists um, clean up after the mess of white supremacists um, there were other members of congress there were staffers there were children and so um, all of this is to say is that my story is just one story. It's not the only story, nor is it anywhere close to the central story. Um, but the reason why I think it's important to share is because so many of the people who helped perpetrate and who take responsibility for what happened in the Capitol are trying to tell us all to move on. And they're trying to tell us to forget about what happened. They're trying to tell us that it wasn't a big deal. They're trying to tell us to move on without any accountability, without any truth telling, or without actually confronting the extreme damage, physical harm, loss of life, and trauma that was inflicted on not just me as a person, not just other people as, as individuals, but as on all of us as a collective and on many other people. And that, that we cannot move on without accountability. We cannot heal without accountability. And so all of these people um, who want to tell us to move on are doing so at their own convenience. Um, the other thing that I want to um, say is that to friends and loved ones close to me, um, I want to apologize to them in advance. Sorry if my voice is shaking, but um, if you are learning things about me in the course of this live that you didn't know before, um, and it's not, you know, a thing about hiding or anything like that, but, um, 
you know, sometimes you just can't tell the same story over and over. So anyways, the reason I say this and the reason I'm getting emotional in this moment is because these folks who tell us to move on, that it's not a big deal, that we should forget what's happened, or even telling us to apologize, um, these are the same tactics of abusers. And um, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and I haven't told many people that in my life. Um, but when we go through trauma, trauma compounds on each other. And so whether you had a negligent or, you know, a neglectful parent and, or whether you had someone who was verbally abusive to you, um, whether you are a survivor of abuse, um, whether you experience any sort of trauma um, in your life, small to large, these episodes can compound on one another. There's no, you know, something really big happening to you and then you deal with it and then you move on and then when something else happens to you you deal with that and then when you and then you move on all of our experiences make us who we are and um and that's also to say that most people live with trauma and it's not to and that doesn't even diminish you know any of the trauma that any one of us may have been through um, but it is to say that there is a community of so many people who can understand. Um, so when I see a party who cheered on violence, violence that killed five, maybe now six people, a second Capitol Police officer took their life in the aftermath of the attack um, this past week, when we are still losing people, um, when we don't know how many people are gonna develop PTSD after what happened, when we don't know how many people are still hospitalized. I mean, there are people who, sure, they may not have passed away, but they lost fingers, they lost eyes. Um, and these people are just trying to tell us it's not a big deal. And they're trying to say, you're making too big a deal over it. Or my favorite, um, this past week, Ted Cruz and now representatives Chip Roy and oh, by the way, some of the other representatives who actually encouraged people to threaten members of Congress or tweeted out the location of the speaker are now telling me to apologize for saying and speaking truth to what happened. These are the tactics of abusers, or rather, these are the tactics that abusers use. And so when I see this happen, how I feel and how I felt was not again. I'm not gonna let this happen again. I'm not gonna let it happen to me again. I'm not gonna let it happen to the other people who've been victimized by this situation again. And I'm not letting, gonna let this happen to our country, ever. I'm not gonna let it happen. And so, as I said, um, and I've, as I've kind of said earlier, is that the other reason why I have hesitated to tell this story has to do with some of that trauma. You know, um, as a survivor, um, I struggle with the idea of being believed. And what's odd is that I am in a job where people are constantly calling me untruthful or that I'm exaggerating, um, et cetera. Um, so there's a great irony in that. Um, but the reason why I think it's important for us to hold this to account is that because we know that if we do not hold people accountable, what they are asking for when they say, can we just move on? Is that what they are asking is, can you just, can we just forget this happened so that I can do it again? 
without recourse. And that's what these folks are asking. The folks who are saying we should move on, we shouldn't have accountability, etc., are saying, can you just forget about this so that we can you know, do it again? Because that's what we're asking when we don't um, actually hold to account. And you know, in these past three weeks, I felt like it was important to give a window of opportunity, right? Maybe in some world, Senators Josh Hawley or Senator Ted Cruz or Representative Mo Brooks would say, you know what? I was mistaken. I did not fully realize what the impact of my actions was going to be. And now in retrospect, I see that it incited something that I never wanted to incite. And for that, I am sorry. But no, they've had almost a month and they haven't said that. They have doubled down and they said, I did the right thing. And if I could go back, I would do it all over again. So that tells me that these people remain a present danger because what that tells me is that when given another window of political opportunity for themselves, even if they know that it means that it will endanger their colleagues, they will do it again. And that's the real reason why I think that Senator Josh Hawley needs to resign, why Senator Ted Cruz needs to resign, along with many others, because they will do it again. Now let's move on to the story. One of the things that I would like us to dispel is the idea that this insurrection and this attack happened suddenly. That we couldn't see it coming and that it was like just this outburst and all of a sudden a bunch of people rushed the Capitol. Um, I want to dispel with that notion very quickly because everybody knew that something was going to happen. Um, and again, I do not speak for any other, let me, let me actually rewind this. And I'll, I'll try to recenter. And again, as I said, thank you for your patience here. But um, what I'm about to tell you is my account, how I perceive things with my eyes, my ears, my nose, my mouth, <laughs> um, my body. I cannot speak for what anyone else saw, etc., unless there was someone in the room with me. But here's what I will tell you. A week before, one week before, the week prior to the insurrection, I started to get text messages that I needed to be careful. And that in particular, I needed to be careful about the 6th. Um, for the timeline for you to know, uh, this Congress got sworn in that Sunday and the insurrection happened you know, Sunday, then the insurrection happened Wednesday. So there was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I probably started getting text messages about um, having me having plans um, for my safety or me trying to figure something out about Thursday. Um, and those text messages came from other members of Congress. Um, not, they were not threats, but they were other members saying that they knew um, and that they were hearing even from Trump people and Republicans um, that they knew in their life that there was violence expected on Wednesday. Um, so that was what I was hearing that prior Thursday. So then that night, Thursday or Friday, so then that night I immediately contacted my staff and I said, um, we need to figure out a security plan and we need to figure out what we're going to do. So um, we get sworn in that Sunday. The, the next day, that Monday, was one of the first legislative votes that we had in this new Congress. 
Um, it was on something called a rules package. And so this is, you know, you guys don't really, the, the content of it isn't super important, but, um, but basically what the rules does is that it sets down the rules that we all must abide by for the 117th Congress that we're now in. So it's a vote. Now, what happened was that this is normally a procedural vote. It's supposed to have, um, you know, it's supposed to be like a pretty normally scheduled. But what happened was that Republicans objected to the fact that the rules were gender neutral, that it didn't have man or woman or he or she or whatever, but it was just talking about people. Um, the rules were gender neutral. And so uh, Republicans in the, in the House decided that they were going to make a big fight over this. So what this means is that they try to make things as procedurally difficult to pass as possible. So that meant that there was an unscheduled vote or rather there was a vote that was kind of called quickly that day. It was like the second vote, like, you know, we voted in the morning to start. And then there was another vote that was triggered. And so I had just kind of gotten back to where I was staying and grabbing a cup of coffee, really, when the second vote was called. Again, this is Monday. The attack happens Wednesday. And I remember rolling back up. I had to go right back up. Um, and, you know, due to COVID, uh, I usually travel by train due to COVID. I now um, drive by car and I travel by car, um, not a combustion engine vehicle, <laughs> um, but I travel by car between New York and DC. And so I, um, I drove up, um, and yeah. And so I drove up to the Capitol and I thought I got really lucky because I found a parking spot right in front of the stairs that go up to the Capitol. And I was like, nice, this never happens. Usually I have to like park in the boonies and walk all the way over. And so I park and um, and what I start to notice is that these this crowd of insurrectionists is already in town. So people want to make and pretend and a lot of these Republicans want to act like this all happened on Wednesday. But these people started coming on Monday. And um, and so when the vote was called. And they were holding rallies and doing all of this stuff, you know, starting on Monday of that day. So when the vote was called, um, people started, um, people like th this crowd that would eventually rush the Capitol, they would start running and like coming near the Capitol uh, when votes were called to see members of Congress walk in. And so I parked my car. And uh, I park right in front of the Capitol, but actually there's like a fence right behind. It's kind of like if you're in New York City, sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm sure other cities do this too, but I'm just speaking to my experience. Like, you know, when you guys go to a parade and there's just like that aluminum fencing to keep the, like to, to mark off the parade route and it's just like waist high, just like aluminum fence. And sometimes the police like pull it aside to let people cross the street. There was just one of those in the perimeter around the Capitol. And there are all these people with like these huge like flagpoles with the spear tips and whatnot. I remember seeing all of this and being like, this is weird. <laughs> That's suspicious. <laughs> because if you so much as say Black Lives Matter around the Capitol Hill complex, it's like nine barricades go up. I mean, if you see the protests, and the amount of militarization um, from last year's protests, it was like, boom, 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 boom. National Guard comes in, like all these militarized people are around. And here you have, you know, we know that violence is coming. I've been getting all of these, um, you know, text messages. I've been getting people, and including other members of Congress, telling me that I need to be careful. Um, say lots of people saying that violence is expected on the six and there's like just like a waist high parade fence just one layer deep of it by the way not even multiple just one little inky dinky aluminum fence around um and I was like well that's kind of weird but you know maybe they plan on putting up more tomorrow because it is Monday right it's Monday the, the, you know, they're really expecting violence on Wednesday. So maybe they haven't put it up yet. Maybe it'll kind of come up tomorrow. But that thought was kind of coming into my head. And so um, 
I come up and I go in to vote and I come back down and there is a crowd of Republican kind of like Trump people that have crowded behind my car. And my car, again, is like maybe two feet in front of them, no joke. And there's just this one little aluminum fence between them and like this crowd of people. So they see me coming and they like, they're, they're like so hyped <laughs> that they see me coming down. And so I'm coming down and they're like, hey, it's AOC, it's AOC, like blah, 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 blah. And, um, and I honestly just like play along, you know, one of the things that my, um, that some of like my campaigns and organizers tell me is that, you know, people may have a certain impression of me, but when they actually meet me in person, um, I like to think I'm a little disarming. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, cause I actually engage people and especially when Fox news has kind of like drum me up to be this like crazy cartoon character when people meet me in person and I'm not that crazy cartoon character that they've created on television, like people don't really know what to do. So anyways, I kind of come down and these people are like, Hey, I'll say, Hey, I'll say, blah, blah, blah. And so I walk down towards them and they're right behind my car. And they all pull out their phones and they say, hey, AOC, why do you hate this country? Recording me. Why do you hate this country? And I look back at them and I said, hate this country. I was like, I love this country. That's why I dedicate every day of my life to it. Who would do that if they hated this country? And they just like... Everyone in the crowd was just like, um, well, what? she's driving a car. She's driving a car. Like, they didn't know what to say in that moment. Um, and so they were trying to make a thing about, you know, me um, driving a car and being an environmentalist. And they're like, oh, she's, she's driving a car, like blah, blah, blah. And then they see that I drive an electric car. <laughs> so then that argument goes out. Um, and then they're just like, Oh, you just think you're fancy. You just think you're better. Like, blah, blah. where does that come from? I don't know. But, you know, it's literal, like, schoolyard bully silliness. Um, and so, you know, I got a kick out of it in that moment, too. And I was like, and, you know, I just started, like, messing with them. I was just saying, <laughs> I was just like... Yeah, man, like whatever, like you do you, you know. But on the inside, I'm gonna tell you, my heart was beating really fast because these, there's a crowd of people with spear, I mean, you know, spear-like instruments, however people would, you know, classify that, um, mobbed right behind my car. And so my, my heart is beating pretty fast, um, but I'm still like in this back and forth and I'm trying to lighten the mood. And so they're just like, oh, you know, and then there's, it's actual, it's actually so dumb. These schoolyard bully chants, they're like, oh, well, I'm surprised she even knows how to drive a car, blah, 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 you know? And so I just start going like, see you guys. Like I just start like blowing kisses at them, you know, whatever, just to create enough space for me to hit drive and screw get out of there. So that's what happened on Monday. So on Monday, um, we were already, as members of Congress, having heightened interactions um, with these people. And so anyone who tells you that we couldn't have seen this coming is lying to you. Anyone who's gone on the record and said that there was no indication of violence has lied. There were so many indications of this leading up to that moment. They were there on Monday. So I go back and I head back home that day until we finish um, our votes. And there is a grocery store on my block and I remember going to the grocery store that night 
and seeing all these people in like these MAGA hats and it felt like tense in the grocery store. And I guess this is just like, you know, whether you're from the Bronx or New York City or Queens or Brooklyn, wherever, whether you're from Chicago, whether you're just, I don't know, you also just have your wits about you in a rural area. You just can catch a vibe and you can kind of know a general sense of when things aren't right. And things started to feel not right when I was in that grocery store that Monday night. Fast forward, Tuesday. Now we're on Tuesday. And we're at there next Tuesday and um, another vote, you know, it was another voting day, vote was called. So I go down um, to go head to votes when I see another member um, on the way and I offer them, they look like they were going to walk to the vote. And so I offered them a ride. So I offer them a ride um, to the Capitol and there were even more people, unsurprisingly, even more people um, that were there um, in, in around the Capitol. And this time there's like even more rallies. They have like their mics, their speakers and everything set up. And it felt actively like volatile and dangerous. Like it, it had gotten to the point where it's where I don't think a lot of people felt safe walking to votes. And it was it was already the kind of situation where um, we needed to drive or take a tunnel or something like that to the Capitol. That was on Tuesday. Um, I drive. We take them to the vote. You know, we come back. Um, and then I realized on Tuesday, I was like, oh, shoot, I left my keys. I left the, my keys to the apartment. Um, and so I, I head back and, um, and I, I head back to go pick up my keys. And the important thing to realize is that, you know, the majority of people in the House and in Congress, they're all congregating around the time of the vote. But if you're going when there isn't a vote, active vote going on, like in the actual Capitol complex where that big dome is, um, it's pretty empty. And so I go in, I get my keys, and there were people watching. Like I had parked there, and there were already people watching me walk into the Capitol to the point where it just like didn't feel safe. And so on Tuesday, I... On Tuesday, I started taking my pin off. You know, we have these congressional pins that identify members on the Capitol complex for security reasons. And ironically, um, when I was, I, by Tuesday, I was already taking my pin off by the time I left the building so that if someone was looking from far away, they might think I was just, you know, another 5'4", five, 5'5", girl walking around that might be an intern. Um, and so I was already taking my pin off and making proactive measures because I already felt unsafe on Tuesday. I head back to the grocery store and um, I go in to buy a bottle of matcha tea because I needed the parking validation. <laughs> and I go in to buy a bottle of tea and the tension in in the grocery store with these people already started escalating to the point where it literally felt like people were looking at me in the grocery store deciding what they were going to do like are we going to do something right now like they were making i could see the calculations going on behind their eyes um, and it was 100% like when you're in a bodega at one o'clock in the morning and you don't know if someone's about to get jumped. It felt like that in a bougie grocery store. Like it was crazy. I mean, could, and like, what? Anyways, um, so I... Starting like around noon that day when I was in the grocery store, I had already come to the conclusion that it was not safe for me to be outside. 24 hours before, it was not safe to be outside. 
And so I go back to my apartment and just stay in for the rest of the day, go back doing my work, conference calls, like whatever it is that I had to do. But the understanding was that if we needed something or anything like that, I was going to send my partner or send somebody else because it was no longer safe for me to be anywhere in public in Washington, DC, 24 hours on that Tuesday. Now, um, there were a lot of people asking, a lot of other members, and I see that there's some members here on the call. I see you, Jamal, I see you, Mondaire. They can co-sign, yo. They can co-sign <laughs> some of the details of this situation. <laughs> um, so, basically, um, there were members asking, like, what's the security plan? Because the day of the Electoral College certification, everyone has told us, and we already feel and know that this situation is pretty volatile. And so um, the essentially what Capitol Police told House Admin is, don't worry, all of the plans are taken care of, but we can't tell you the details because telling you the details may leak, may cause a leak, and we don't want people who are trying to plan harm to know the details of our security plan. This is what was told to members of Congress by Capitol Police leadership. This is like the leadership of Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms. Um, and so that's what they told everyone. So they said, don't worry about it. We got it. All we need you to do is show up at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. So for context, most members of Congress, our days are very busy, even in Capitol Hill. So sometimes we're in our office, sometimes we're visiting an event, sometimes we go back to, especially during um, COVID, a lot of members may work out of their homes or apartments or whatever. Um, so there may be, mem there are members all over the Capitol um, and so normally when a vote is called, every member is just like walking through, um, and they'll come to the Capitol from wherever they are in the city to vote and then leave. Um, and so what Capitol Police told us, it, and what Capitol Police leadership told us was, um, okay, now every member needs to be on the Capitol complex by 9 a.m. on the day of the Electoral College vote. And we said... Okay, um, so that's what we made plans to do. Now, I, you know, as you all know, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and I are quite close, and so we carpooled together. <laughs> um, and we carpooled together um, to the Capitol complex, and we drove in um, to head over and um, and then go to our offices. And so I get to my office, I don't know, 9.30, we're running a little behind, whatever. And so we head there, um, pro I don't know, like around 9.30 or so. Um, and, um, and we head there and I'm in my office like multiple hours before we really need to be in my office. Because, um, you know, that's just what Capitol Police leadership told us to do. So we show up and also because this is a pretty important vote, um, just so that you all know, my entire office has been teleworking due to COVID. I don't make them come in physically. Um, everyone has been on work from home, um, except when there's a really big uh, vote like this, we'll have one person come in, one of my staffers come in and escort me um, and attend me through the vote, right? So I had my legislative director come in um, and he was attending me for the vote. And so it was just he and I in my office. My office is relatively new because um, I had to move offices between terms. They're doing construction, it's a long story. Point is I'm in a brand new office. There's boxes and stuff everywhere. And, um, and 
So I'm with my legislative director, we're there at 9 a.m. And since I had to be there, ironically, hours before my vote, get this, we scheduled my vaccine appointment that morning. And so I figured, well, if I'm gonna be here for a couple of hours, I'm eligible for my, ooh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, I'm eligible for my second dose. And so I'm gonna go and get my vaccine. Um, since I've got a couple of uh, hours to spare. And so I'm gonna go grab my second dose. And so I headed down. And so for you all to know, there's the Capitol Hill complex, but members of Congress, except for you know the speaker and other very, very high ranking ones, don't actually work in that building with the dome. There's buildings like right next to the dome and that's where our actual offices are. So, um, so what happens is that I go and I grab my vaccine. And I go and have my vaccine appointment. And um, I head out there and I go to get my appointment and I go and I get the shot. And I actually, I took a video for you guys. Maybe I'll, sh I'll share it to my IG story after this live is done. Um, and so I took a video. I said, you know, I told you guys I was going to tell you everything about what was happening with the vaccine and the side effects and whatnot. And so I was recording my second dose. Um, and so I recorded myself going down. I go there, I take the shot. Now, some timestamps for you all. This is probably happening around noon. And the clashes started happening around 1.20 p.m. So now we're on like this TikTok, okay? So, um, so the clashes start happening, would have started happening that day around 1.20 p.m. Um, or so. And it, around 12 p.m., I'm walking to the site where the house physician is administering vaccines. I'm recording. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm going to grab my vaccine. I'm going to tell you what it's like, blah, blah, blah. I record the shot going into my arm, same way that happened last time. And then after you take your vaccine, um, you have to sit. Um, if, if some of you, especially medical professionals, um, et cetera, have, have seen or know of someone who, who has gotten the first shot yet, um, you have to like sit for about 15 minutes, right? And so I go, I go in, I check in, I get my shot. I'm asking the nurse all these questions because if I'm gonna be completely honest, so much love to the nurse that gave it to me, this one hurt a little bit more than the first one. <laughs> so I was like, is this the same dose? Are you guys like putting more in? Is the volume different? <laughs> but no, I mean, everything is the same for you to know, um, but whatever, this one just like poked me a little bit more this time. And so um, I go, I get my shot. And then um, I sit for about 15 minutes for the observation period. Um, so I sit there, God bless everyone um, and the house physician's office. They did an incredible, wonderful job. Um, and, um, and they, you know, my observation period went fine and they let me go. So I start walking back to my office and um, my arm hurts. <laughs> my arm's a little sore, right? Um, and I start heading back to my office. Um, and, you know, the walk back is, is a considerable walk. I head back to my office. We get back in. Um, my legislative director's name is G. And so G and I head back to my office, sit back down. I go back to my office. Um, G is in the legislative office. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, um, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? This is really messed up that G has to come into work today because this electoral college certification has just gotten so out of control and so contentious um, that I'm gonna order us a really awesome lunch. And so I start scrolling um, and I like wanna order like, I'm like, I'm gonna get us an amazing lunch. I'm gonna get us a banging lunch. Um, because, you know, it's just the right thing to do. And so we start doing that and I, I start trying to figure out where I'm gonna order lunch from. And my chief of staff calls. Now, this is around 12.45 p.m. So my chief of staff calls me and asks me, hey, how are you feeling? And I, I told her, 
Um, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling amazing because Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff had just won the election the night before. And I was feeling sick to my stomach on Monday and even worse on Tuesday about Wednesday. It just felt like this tension was just, I thought I was going to really throw up. I felt so scared um, the two days before that about what was going to happen on Wednesday. And then when when John Ossoff and Reverend Warnock won that election, I mean, I was singing Nina Simone that morning. I felt like it had just taken a weight off of all of our shoulders. And it was just an outcome that was just beyond our wildest dreams. And so when she said, um, how are you feeling? I said, I, you know, I'm feeling amazing. I'm, And part of me even naively felt like maybe that will take the wind out of these people's sails a little bit um, because the Senate, the Senate, is ours, you know, the Senate um, belongs to the people now and the Senate has been won. And so um, I was feeling great. And so that conversation lasts about 15 minutes. So that takes us to about 101 p.m. And I go back to scrolling through lunch options um, for what we're gonna order when all of a sudden I hear boom, 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 boom on my door. And then I hear these huge, violent bangs on my door and then every door going into my office. Just bang, bang. Oh, shoot, see, look, I'm banging over again. <laughs> like someone was trying to break the door down. And um, there were, there was no, um, no voices. There were no yells, no one saying who they were, nobody identifying themselves and just boom, boom, boom. And I, I just get up like this and I run over to the legislative office and I run over to G and G just looks at me back and he just goes, hide, hide, run and hide. And so I, I run back into my office. I slam my door. There's another kind of like back area to my office and, um, I, I open it and there's a closet and, and a bathroom and I jump into my bathroom um, and I close the door and I just keep hearing these bang, bang, bang. And, uh, and I jump into my bathroom and I close the door and then I realize that I, the bathroom was the wrong choice. I, I should have jumped into the closet. And so I start opening the the, the I start opening um, the door to the bathroom so that I can Oh, sorry, you guys can't hear me. Um, so I start, I hear these bang, bang, bangs. And um, I start opening the door to my office. And um, I start opening the door to my bathroom. And I'm going to run across um, to the closet. And sorry, you guys said I'm muffled. So let me repeat this part a little bit over again. Sorry, this is a little hard to hear, guys. I'm trying to like, as you know, my phone keeps falling. Um, and so basically, I go into the back and there's a bathroom and then there's a closet and I jump into the bathroom and I immediately realized that I shouldn't have gone into the bathroom. I should have jumped in the closet. And so I, I open the door when all of a sudden I hear that whoever was trying to get inside got into my office. Um, and then I realize that it's too late that it's too late for me to get into the closet. And so I try to kind of, I go back in and I, I hide back in, um, in the bathroom behind the door. 
And then I just start to hear these yells of, where is she? Where is she? And I just thought to myself, they got inside. And so I hide behind my door like this, like I'm here and the bathroom door starts going like this, like the bathroom door is behind me or rather in front of me. And I'm like this and the door hinges right here. And I just hear, where is she? Where is she? And um, this was the moment where I thought everything was over. Um, and the weird thing about moments like these is that you lose all sense of time. Um, in retrospect, um, maybe it was four seconds. Maybe it was five seconds. Maybe it was 10 seconds. Maybe it was one second. I don't know. It felt like my brain was able to have so many thoughts in that moment um, between these screams and these yells of where is she, where is she? And so I go down and I just, I mean, I thought I was going to die. Um, and I had a lot of thoughts. You have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I think when you're in a situation like that, um, and like also one of those thoughts that I had was, you know, I just happened to, you know, be a spiritual person and be raised in that context. And I really just felt like, you know, if this is the plan for me, um, then people will be able to take it from here. Um, I had a lot of thoughts but that was the thought that I had about you all. Um, I felt that um, if this was the journey that my life was taking, that I felt that things were going to be okay. Um, um, and that, you know, I had fulfilled my purpose. Anyways, um, sorry guys. So anyways, as I'm hiding in this bathroom, I'm hiding in this bathroom, um, hearing these yells of these men or just this, a man, just one man going, where is she? Where is she? I start to look through the door hinge to see if I can see anything. And there's like a door here and there's like another door here. So I'm like, I'm like trying to look through do two door hinges. Um, and so I look through this door hinge and I see this um, white man in a black beanie um, bump, just like open the door of my personal office and come inside the personal office and yell again, where is she? Um, and I have never been quieter in my entire life. I was just, I, I don't even know if I held my breath, but I was just, you know, here behind there and I just start sliding down. Um, and then all of a sudden I hear my staffer G yell out. Um, and he's, he's like, hey, 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 it's okay, come out come out. So I'm like, I don't know, so deeply rattled. I'm still processing the edge of my life when I come out. Um, and I come out and this man is a Capitol police officer, but the story doesn't end. Um, it's a Capitol Police officer. There was no partner, was not yelling, you know, Capitol Police, etc., etc. 
but then what but then it didn't feel right um because he was looking at me with a tremendous amount of anger and hostility and um things weren't adding up like there was no partner there and there was no one was yelling he wasn't yelling like this is capital police this is capital police and he was looking at me in all of this anger and and hostility and at first you know in in my brain and in my mind i'm thinking okay i just came from this super intense experience just now maybe i'm reading into this right like maybe i'm projecting um maybe i'm projecting like something onto him that that like maybe i'm just seeing anger but maybe he's not trying to be angry um but I talked to G, my legislative director, after the fact, and he said, no, I didn't know if he was there to help us or hurt us either. And um, and G was actually like, th this man came with so much hostility that, um, that G was sizing him up and didn't know if he was gonna have to fight him. Like that is how, that is how like aggressive the situation was in that moment and we couldn't even tell we couldn't read if like this was a good situation or a bad situation um it was so like you know like so many other communities in this country like just that presence doesn't necessarily give you a clear signal if you're safe or not and so the situation did not feel okay and then he just looks at me and yells at me and he just goes go down and then go to this other building um i'm not gonna like name the specific building but he basically says go down and go to this building but he just says the name of the building doesn't say anything else but we're so rattled in that moment and he f the situation felt so volatile with this officer that I run over, I grab my bag, and we just start running over to that building. Now, mind you, um, we weren't escorted. He didn't like come with us or follow us um, or anything like that. So G and I just start running to this other building. We run down and we run to this other building. And it wasn't until we get to that building that we realized he didn't give us a specific location. Um, he didn't give us a room. He didn't give us a place to go to. He just gave us, he said, go down. He told us to go to a certain level of a certain building. And that level of that building was street level. And so we can hear, um, because the buildings were not secure yet, um, and this is around the time when the Capitol was being stormed, um, that we can like hear all of these rioters behind the glass of the doors, <laughs> you know? And we have no specific location to go to. We're in the hallway. We're in like like the Dunkin' Donuts of the basement. And we don't have any secure place to go. And so we're in just an open hallway. And we hear the yells of these people trying to break into the building that we're in. And, um, and I'm just like, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to go. And so I think, and there are two members of Congress that I know in that building. And I was like, let's go there. And so it literally felt like just i don't know it, it almost felt like a zombie movie or something and so i thought one of the members in my you know in my head i'm just like i i think they're on the fifth floor so i run to the fifth floor and we start going around and this is when we start losing precious time um we start hearing the yells we go up to the fifth floor we start hearing the yells of these people and then we hear like other capitol police trying to protect the building barking back at these people and it just feels like it's just a matter of seconds when um when these doors are going to break through and they're going to get in um and so it's the fifth floor and we run around and i'm not finding this member's office um and we circle, we go all the way around 
Um, and I'm like, shoot, she's not here. She's not here. And so I literally go on Google and I'm like Googling on public information <laughs> what floor um, they're on. And so I start, we start realizing, oh, they're on the fifth floor. They're on the first floor. Um, the fifth floor is where the progressive caucus meets. So that's why I have that muscle memory, um, at least where we met pre-COVID. And anyway, so I just start, we start running down this spiral staircase to the first floor. Um, and we get to the first floor and we hear the yells getting louder and louder, like, rah, 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 you know, just like, like I, I hear like, like the hinges cracking, you know, it just feels like you can hear all of this yelling and screaming. Um, and as we're going down the spiral staircase closer to the street level, like the yells only get louder and louder and louder that you hear. Um, and so, um, so we run to this member's office and I start knocking on the door. I start banging on it. And like at this point, no one is in any of the hallways and we're completely alone, completely alone. And so I start banging on this door and I said, it's okay. It's me. It's me. Let me in. Um, and they may not have heard me or something like that. I call them. Um, and you know, all of this is, I don't know, maybe happening in 30 seconds, 60 seconds. It's really hard to kind of attest to the passage of time, but it happened so fast and I just like couldn't get through immediately. So I realized that I had actually passed by Katie Porter's office. Um, and all of this stuff was happening so quickly that I saw Katie Porter like going into her office, just like holding a cup of coffee <laughs> because all of these developments were happening so rapidly that I think some people were at different awareness levels and at different like urgency levels than others. And so, um, so I start running back and I saw, I, I remember that I had seen Katie getting, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Representative Porter. I got to put respect on everybody's names. <laughs> so I saw Representative Porter walking to her office. And so I run back um, and I knock on the door and I'm just like, bang, 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 bang. And, um, and she opens and I'm like, Hey Katie, can I, can I, can I shelter with you right now? And Katie's like, yeah, of course. Come on in. Like, yeah, come on. And so we go into her office and, um, I'm at like a 10, right? Like I am at a full 10 fight or flight thought I was going to die like 10 minutes ago, then thought I was going to die again because I have to tell you that when I was banging on this door, I had thought, fully expected that by this point, the building had been breached and there were people walking the hallways. Like this is this was what I had fully expected to be have, having been gone on in that moment. And so when we're outside in this hallway alone, I'm banging on this door and I'm thinking, and I'm fully expecting um, one of these insurrectionists to turn the corner with a gun and that it would be over again. Um, and so we run back um, and, and, uh, and I'm like at a 10 because I've probably had two times today that I already thought that I was going to die. Um, and I'm like, <laughs> like, you know, get into bus into Katie's office and Katie's like having a cup of coffee. Like I think the information's still trickling in, etc. And so I start, you know, ripping through Katie's office like a mad woman. Um, and, uh, you know, poor Katie, I'm like opening every closet. Um, I'm opening every nook. I'm opening like every cranny looking for where I'm going to hide when they get into this office. Um, and I tell Katie, I say, cause there's a, there's a, a gym in the house office building. And I turned to Katie and I said, have, have any of your st staffers left any workout clothes or anything under their desks? And she was like, uh, yeah, like I'll check. And so, um, and she, she starts like looking through and looking through um, and she finds this, um, this bag, um, and you know, in just perfect fashion, like she's super collected and I'm just like, we need this, we need that. And she's like, bam, bam. And you know, we're working together. Um, and so I pull, like she pulls this, um, she pulls this like bag, 
um, of workout clothes from one of her staffers and it has like sneakers in it. Um, and so I pull the sneakers and this whole time I'm still in high heels, right? And so I'm like, you know, going around looking through all this stuff. Um, they find some snacks, things like that. And G is pushing, G and some of the other staffers are, are pushing like the couches up against um, the door. And, you know, I had this thought then and I, you know, so many have made this point since, but it's like all of these drills that um, people had on school shootings. It was like, okay, we're gonna push the furniture up against the door, we're gonna barricade us in, you know, et cetera. And so G is like pushing the furniture up. Um, I'm looking for clothes to change into. And the reason why I'm feeling like we need clothes to change into is because um, if I need to jump out a window or if I need to run, I need to blend in with the crowd as much as possible. And if I'm in high heels, um, if I'm in my congressional, you know, I'm, if I'm in like workwear and my dress, um, I'd be easily recognized in a crowd. And so, um, so I'm like going through all of these things um, and um, Katie has an extra uh, like puffy jacket. And so she gives me her extra puffy jacket. So I'm in like this puffy jacket. I'm in, I'm in someone else's puffy jacket. I'm in someone else's sneakers. Um, and I'm fully just like bracing for impact for these people to breach the perimeter of our building. Um, and so many things happen in this period when we are kind of, when we were um, sheltering together. Um, and um, and like all these crazy thoughts go into, go through your mind and even like just racially, even, even, you know, Katie and I were having these conversations and it's like, it, it like where you feel like we as members, our nameplates are next to our offices. And it's like, are some offices safer than others because they have white sounding names or because they have male sounding names or like who would be safer to hide in because you would expect them least in that office, you know, like all these crazy things that you're thinking. Um, and, um, and it, it's like, this is what it's come to. Um, and so we were sheltering in there for a long time, making all these conting contingency plans. And we turned off all the lights because I was afraid that, um, you know, it's January in Washington, DC, the sun sets mad early. It's like 345 and the sun is already setting. Um, and so, so I'm like, we got to turn off all the lights because if they see the offices with the lights on, like who knows if they target that, you know, at this point we start getting intelligence that bombs have been found, um, one about like one block away from where we were one or two blocks away from where we were. And then a second one, like three blocks away from where we were. Um, and, um, and so I'm also fully expecting, or maybe not expecting, but I'm wondering like, or feeling or preparing for one, one of the wings of the building to explode um, because we had gotten intelligence that there were bombs found um, very close to where we were. And so we're sheltering and I'm thinking, what do we do if the building explodes? What do we do if this happens? What do we do if they break into this office that we're in? Um, and, you know, through all of this, what also felt crazy traumatizing is just feeling like there were people that were willing to do what they needed to do. You know, the incredibly brave uh, staffers that were with us, um, G and Katie staffers um, and others that were with us and, um, and that they were making decisions to put 
themselves between us and any potential danger that would break into that room. And um, you really struggle with that because those aren't your decisions and you don't want, um, you don't want anyone to do that. Um, but people say, no, I'm going to do this. And um, you really sit with that, with the weight of that. Um, we had these emergency hoods and I find out later, you know, when we start getting these emergency announcements that when they were evacuating our building earlier that day, we were supposed to take our emergency hoods with us. It's a long story. Point is, is that there are emergency supplies. We were supposed to take our emergency supplies with us. And that, that Capitol police officer didn't tell us anything about that. He didn't tell us, bring your hoods. He didn't tell us, do this. He didn't tell us, do that. Um, and what's really weird in the aftermath of that situation is that after you see the videos, after you hear about what happened with Capitol Police leadership, um, after you know that leadership knew about the threats of violence and didn't prepare adequately for it, you start thinking back at all of these things and, you know, I think about that officer and just the uncertainty, you know, did he just, did he not say that he was Capitol Police on purpose? Did he lose himself in that moment? Did he make, did he tell us, did he not give us the extraction point location because he forgot? Or was he trying to actually put us in a vulnerable, you know, situation? just the very uncertainty that you don't know if that person was actually trying to protect you or not is already deeply unsettling. Um, and, you know, I'm not here to say that, that any, I'm not here to pass judgment on any one individual or on any one officer or this, that, and the other, you know, and, um, a lot of Republicans mischaracterize my position um, and Fox News amplifies a lot of these lies, um, which in turn leads to a lot of violent threats. Um, and I could do a whole other IG live on other times that I thought I was going to die. And like, I tend to deal with things as well with humor and dark humor. And it was like one of the things I was telling my staff that day was like, well, at least this isn't the first time I thought I was going to die in my first term. Um, but um but it's that lack of trust that creates so much volatility um, and fear. And so it's like I look back on this memory and I remember trying to excavate like every shred of evidence to be like, it was just a tough situation. But I just don't, you just don't know. You just don't know. And so, um, you know, It, it's an intense situation. So anyways, there's a lot more details in this time that I was barricaded with Katie Porter, um, but I don't want to belabor it. And I also don't know which of these details quite yet are okay to share and which aren't. Um, but the point of the situation was that we felt completely unsafe. And eventually we did find the extraction point. Um, we did find the we did find out what the extraction point was, and we found out that all the members of Congress were being directed to this one point. And with the amount of uncertainty in this situation, um, I just felt like I'm not going there. Like there were members who were live tweeting the location of the speaker that were probably going to be in that extraction point they were still, there was still uncertainty about whether there were still bombs throughout the city. Um, it just legitimately did not feel safe. And so, um, you know, I, at first I was like, there's no way that I'm going there. Um, and so we stayed in, in that room and, um, 
you know, the also the other fear in this situation too is where was the National Guard? And at the time, you know, now we know more stories about this, but at the time, National Guard wasn't called. And I was starting to get just this feeling in my gut that, like, in any other situation like this, they would be called, they would be here. Um, and they're not coming. And we didn't know if they were being held off or what, but in the event that the National Guard didn't come, it was just a matter of time before the building got breached. And the sun was setting and in that darkness, things could even get more violent. Um, and so we were just, you know, we didn't know what was gonna happen. And so we were probably barricaded in that building, I mean, in that room together, I don't even know how many hours five hours or so, um, when finally we were able to get out. Um, and we decided that we, while we weren't going to stay at the extraction point, we would kind of check in to let them know that, you know, where our physical whereabouts were. But also like, this is why I wasn't tweeting that day. Um, because first of all, a lot of people were saying, I'm okay and I'm safe. But I wasn't safe. I didn't feel safe. <laughs> and I wasn't going to lie. <laughs> um, uh, and I didn't feel like I was okay or, you know, secure in any way at any point that day. Um, but I did say I'm okay because I was okay for that moment and in that moment. Um, and I felt a little more okay then. Um, but it was just not the whole situation was not okay. And we didn't know what was going to happen. So then after a little while, um, we kind of find out that the plan is that we're gonna move forward and certify the electoral college results. And, um, you know, it's a, it was a decision that I support. I think it was a right decision. Um, even in the moment though, I was like, what are we doing? Um, either way, it didn't feel like anything we could do was safe. And um, in truth, you know, that was very much a, a possibility um, that nothing that we did was was a safe option. But um, but, you know, ultimately, uh, we made the decision and, and leadership and, um, you know, folks made the decision that we were sent here to do our duty and our duty was to certify the results. Um, and that's what we're here to do and no amount of insurrectionists are going to divert us from that central task of upholding our democracy. Um, but then we had uh, people who still want to challenge the results. And so at this point, you know, there were still going to be quite more votes because there were people still trying to delay and challenge the election results um, after multiple people had died in the violence of the insurrection. So um, that meant that we had to wait. And so uh, with the building feeling more secured in that moment, I walked over to my sis Ayana Presley's office um, and Ayana in true form texts me and she's like, come and eat. <laughs> So she comes to, so I go to her office. Um, she and, and her staffer, Sarah, uh, made sure that I was fed <laughs> and that I had something to eat. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, um, we, th we were there and I stayed with, um, and I stayed in Ayana's office and Katie was there and I told Ayana um, what had happened to me in my office. Um, and I didn't realize because I was like at that 10 um, and like being so intense in Katie's office that in all those hours we were barricaded together, I actually never at any point said out loud to her um, what had happened. And so I'm just in, I was just like in Katie's office, like, out of 10, like, where are the closets? What's the exit thing? Shut the curtains, close the lights, like all this other stuff. Um, and, um, 
yeah, I mean, and it wasn't until she was there and I was telling the story to Ayana that I realized that Ayana hadn't even told it to Katie. And then Katie was like, oh, this is why you were out of 10. And so um, we stayed in Ayana's office and we were there until about four o'clock in the morning. Um, there's other details too. I'm, I'm just like not ready for that right now. Um, but yeah, you know, and I, I stayed with Ayana and it was when I told the story to Representative Presley, um, she told me right away, like that, what you experienced was traumatizing and you need to take care of yourself. Um, and it was like having her as a friend and a sister hear what I was saying and tell me that mentally, it forced me to pump my brakes and be like, oh, oh, um, so, you know, I, I think it, it, it was so important um, and I think for so many people out there, if you have experienced any sort of trauma, like just the, just the fact of like recognizing that and admitting it is already a huge step, um, especially in a world where people are constantly trying to tell you that you didn't experience what you experienced or that you're lying or that, you know, those are those are additional traumas on top of what you've already experienced, right? If you are a survivor of abuse, of neglect, of verbal abuse, of sexual assault, you know, et cetera, um, there's the trauma of going through what you went through. And then there's the trauma afterwards of people not believing you or trying to publicly humiliate you or trying to embarrass you. And that also gets internalized too, because a lot of times you don't wanna believe it either. You don't want to think that that happened to you. You don't want to think that X person hurt you. You don't want to admit that you were a person who has been abused, assaulted, etc. Um, because you don't want to be like a victim, right? And, um, and so there's the doubt that the world puts on you that bad actors puts on you that perpetrators put on you that abuse puts on you. And then there's the doubt that you put on yourself. And so the moment a person actually admits, like, no, I was this thing happened to me and they're willing to say that to themselves, I think is also a really important first step. Um, and, you know, I look back on that and she really helped my healing um, because right in the moment, if you're able to do that, you're not, extending that time period where you're like reacting in a weird way. You don't know why you think you can just move on. It wasn't a big deal, you know, and even in the aftermath of this whole situation, um, I, like I have had to check my own thoughts, you know, part of me is like, maybe I, I like, I shouldn't share this because it's not a big, maybe it's not that it's not a big deal, but like, it's not important to the central story of the insurrection or that like people are gonna say that, oh, she's just trying to make it about her and like all, like all of those, you know, normal nagging thoughts. Um, and like I said, like all of your traumas can kind of intersect and interact. Um, and so, you know, I think um, that being able to recognize that early and in the aftermath of the attack, Congress had counselors come in and advise members, um, especially those who had kind of survived the those like initial, like some, some of those direct encounters on the House floor. And, you know, one of the things that I had heard and that I had remembered people talk about with trauma is that like 
tell your story. Like it's an actual cognitively important thing to do um, is, to, is to tell the story of what happened to you. And then sometimes you just say it a lot and tell it over and over and over again. Um, and that can be a tool for helping a person with healing um, in all traumas. And so, you know, again, just like I said at the very beginning of this, like my story is not the only story, nor is it the central story. It's one of many stories of what these people did um, in creating this environment. And um, these folks who are just trying to tell us to move on are just like pulling the page. They're using the same tactics of every other abuser who just tells you to move on, of that man who touched you inappropriately at work telling you to move on. Are they going to believe you? Or the adult who, you know, if they hurt you when you were a child and you grow up and you confront them about it and they try to tell you that what happened never happened. Or, um, you know, the countless people who tell women and non-binary people that, you know, they're constantly trying to get attention um, just for existing and just for saying that they exist. Like, these are the tactics of abusers. And this is at a point where it's not about the difference of, this is not about a difference of political opinion. This is about just like basic humanity. And, um, and that's what these people don't get. Because they have shown that, you know, we knew we knew that violence was, we knew that violence was expected on the 6th. We knew that that violence was predicated on someone telling the lie, the big lie about our elections. We knew all of this in advance. We knew that violence was planned for the, for the 6th. We knew that that violence depended on the lie, on someone upholding the lie that our elections were fraudulent. Lies that Republican secretaries of state said were a lie. Republicans had said it was a lie. Republican governors had said it was a lie, you know, etc. So we knew in advance that violence was planned. We knew that that violence needed someone to tell the lie. And these senators, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, knew that it was the lie. And they knew that these violent people needed the lie. And they chose because they thought it would be politically advantageous to them. They, they chose to tell the lie. All of these things were known in advance. And then five, six people have lost their lives. Others have lost eyes, limbs. Many more have, have been traumatized. And yet, in, after all of that, after they perpetuated that lie, amplified that lie, knowing that that violence needed that lie, after they told that lie, after they saw people lose their life on the steps of the Capitol, Afterwards, not even an I'm sorry. Not even a I, I didn't I didn't know that me doing this would result or contribute to this violence. And if I had known, I wouldn't do it. And I'm sorry. You know, if in the last three, four weeks we heard that. I'd be my response would be a little different right now. But no, the response in the last three, four weeks is we did the right thing. I would do it again. I would do it again. I don't regret it at all. 
And so if that is your stance for these insurrectionists and these people who incited the violence, if that's their stance, then that means they continue to be, to be a danger to their colleagues. Because what they are saying is, given those same conditions, I will choose to endanger my colleagues again for political gain. That's what they're saying. Without acknowledging anything that they have done, any of the harm that they've created. And that's why we need accountability. We need accountability. Because the accountability is not about revenge. It's not about getting back at people. It's not about any of that. It's about creating safety. And we are not safe with people who hold positions of power, who are willing to endanger the lives of others if they think it will score them a political point. It, because, it, because they want to, what, run for president four years from now? Who cares? Who cares? Like, what is the craven extent of your personal political ambition that you want to be president so bad that you're going to allow people and your own colleagues' lives to be in danger because you think it's going to win you Trump's base? And also, from the perspective of a politician, let me tell you, Donald Trump, he runs a cult of personality. That's not going to transfer to you so quickly and easily as a little base. It doesn't work like that. So even from a political perspective, they are just laying out all their credibility, all their reputation, anything that they could potentially have to be taken as a good faith person in the future to lay down for someone who just will do nothing for them unless it will personally enrich or benefit him. So it doesn't make any sense. So not only it is what they're doing reckless and dangerous and yes, unpatriotic to use their terminology, but it's just not smart, just from a political calculation level. So anyways, I think I've chatted a lot of your ears off. Um, I will save this recording so you guys can watch it uh, if it saves. Um, sometimes, you know, it bugs out um, and it doesn't let me. But um, I appreciate you all taking the time. In the time since, I have been giving myself time and space to try to heal from stuff. I know a lot of other members of Congress have been trying to take their space. And I think that these are important stories to tell. And I hope that I'm not, as I said, you know, my story isn't the only story. It's not, it's far from a central story. Um, but together we have 435 stories. Um, and we need to tell them because every time a Republican gets on television and tries to say, we need to move on and forget about it, they need to be reminded about what they're trying to absolve and excuse. And our stories can do that. And I hope that if you've experienced trauma in your life, I hope you know that you don't need to have experienced the worst thing or the biggest thing. Um, if you experience something, um, talk to someone about it, acknowledge it in your heart, and I hope that you get the courage to do everything that you need to do to heal. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, love you all. Big hugs. Happy snow day. And um, make a snowman for me. Bye-bye.